right, I'm back with impression management goals. And as you can see, I'm having a little bit of trouble here, but let's see if we can do this. I'm just going to put them all up here. Uh, the first one we want to talk about is to be liked. And this is a goal that we all have. Every single one of us wants to be liked by others. So when you're doing your Breakfast Club movie assignment, please only list the goals that you feel a particular character is trying are trying to achieve. So I don't want to hear about the strategies initially, I just want to hear about the goals. In your explanation for how that character is trying to be liked, you may then discuss the strategies. But your very first answer should be a particular goal, and you're going to cover all seven of these goals in your assignment. So make sure that you don't leave any out. So in order to be liked, what we do is we have three strategies that we would most likely use. The first strategy is called immediacy strategies. And immediacy is talked more about in chapter six. But just briefly, what immediacy is, is it's a creation of closeness between speaker and listener. When you are using immediacy strategies, you would convey a sense of interest and attention in the other person, and you would display or demonstrate that you like the other person. And this would relate to both verbal and nonverbal strategies that we would engage in. The next type of strategy that would allow us to achieve our goal of being liked would be affinity-seeking strategies. And on page 74 of your textbook, it lists several I can tell you that in the Breakfast Club clip, some of the strategies that are used is uh, being of help to the other person, appearing to be in control as a leader, presenting yourself as socially equal, presenting yourself as comfortable and relaxed, allowing others to assume control, and uh, appearing active, enthusiastic, and dynamic. So those are just some of the things you could talk about. Now you would also have to explain how the character was being of help, how the character appeared to be in control as the leader. You'd need to get into some specifics. But those are all ways that we can use affinity seeking strategies. And again, this is just to increase your chances of being liked by other people. Last type of strategy that you could use in order to be liked would be to engage in politeness strategies. And those are just common sense, polite behavior that you would engage in to make yourselves appear likable. Saying excuse me, saying please and thank you, request, would you please be willing to do this for me, and not demanding of, of people. Sometimes as uh, parents, we don't care too much about being liked. That's not our goal. And so what we do is in one way, we don't use any politeness strategies. And that can somewhat backfire, I think, in the parent-child communication. So you want to keep that in mind that even though you may be in control, you still want to use politeness strategies. And there's two types of needs that we have that politeness corresponds to and that is we have both a positive face and a negative face and face refers to our impression the impression that we want people to have of us so you want to help people maintain both positive and negative face in front of other people in order to help somebody maintain positive face what we would do is allow them to be thought of as favorable or allow them to be thought of positively by other people. So for example, if I'm out to dinner with a group of friends and my husband is with me and I say, ugh, he's such a slacker, he never ever mows the lawn. I had to call somebody last week to come and mow the lawn because he would not mow the lawn. If my husband is sitting there, I am not allowing him to maintain positive face. In fact, I'm threatening his positive face. And whether or not he cares, I should care as a good communicator that I would not do that in front of our friends. Now, if I want to help my husband maintain negative face, 
what I will do is I will allow him to do as he wishes. So that means if he wishes not to mow the backyard, and rather he prefers to call somebody and have that lawn mowed, that is perfectly acceptable. And that allows him to maintain his negative face and that he can do as he wishes. He doesn't have to mow the lawn at all. He could ask me to mow the lawn or he could call somebody to get the lawn mowed. All of those are options, but ultimately, he can maintain his negative face and do as he wishes. If your mom or your dad ever said to you when you were younger, are you going to wear that? That's a threat to your negative face, and that means they're questioning your ability to be autonomous or make your own choices, and that's why we get so upset. And I'm sorry these bullets aren't cooperating, but I'm not going to fix them, so bear with me. So those are the three strategies uh, going back. Immediacy, affinity, and politeness. Those are the three strategies we can use to be liked. To be liked is the only goal that has three different types of strategies, but it's because it's the most important to us. All of us want to be liked. Okay, the next goal that we have is to be believed. And we want people to believe what we say. We want people to believe who we think we are to be. We want people to believe that we are knowledgeable. We want people to believe that we are worthwhile. Those are all the things that we want to, all the ways in which we want to be believed. We also want people to believe we're competent at whatever it is we do. To do that, we use credibility strategies and we seek to establish our competence, our character, our charisma. And so what you do is you mention things about yourself that other people need to know. So for example, when I start my classes and I'm teaching in the classroom, I will always say I have a bachelor's degree from NAU and I have a master's degree from San Diego State. By telling people that I have a master's degree and then adding that it's in communication, my hope is that you will believe what I say as true. Not because I say it's true, but because I have done the research, because I have written the papers, because I have talked to people, because I have seen it happen in my career as an advertising executive. And so if I add all those things up, I'm hoping that in communicating those things to you, that you will now believe what I say as true, as valid, and as beneficial to you as improving your communication becomes more and more apparent. You also want to stress your character, and that basically means I'm fair and honest, and I may say it at some point during the semester that I don't grade based on what kind of student you are. I grade based on the work in front of me. So just because you may have done not well on the last paper, it doesn't mean that I'm going to say, ugh, this isn't really a good student. I'm going to just grade this a little bit more carefully because I know they're not very good. No, I'm very fair and everybody gets graded exactly the same. So by referring to my fairness or my truthfulness, I now have maintained that I also have good character in addition to my competence. Last but not least is my charisma. I want to show people that I'm take charge, that I have a positive personality, I'm enthusiastic, and I focus on the positive while I'm min minimizing the negative. One of the ways in which I'm charismatic, and people will mention this to me, is I have two sons that are disabled. And what happens is oftentimes people will say to me, why are you so upbeat and happy? And I will say to them, well, there's no reason to be upset. And that is me establishing my charisma and demonstrating that I'm going to focus on the positive and not the negative. So I focus on the positive that I have kids at all. I don't focus on the negative that they're disabled because that just doesn't serve to help anybody. Not me, not my children, and not people that I interact with. The next goal that we often have is called to excuse failure. And I think that this is one that we see, especially when raising teenagers like I'm doing right now, and it's the fact that they want to excuse their failure to the point where it gets a little bit frustrating because we're constantly hearing excuses about why they failed on something. The way that we excuse our failure is we use the strategies called self-handicapping -handicap strategies, excuse me, and this is where you actually set up obstacles to make yourself fail. So for example, if you decide that you are not good at all, 
in algebra and you have an algebra test coming up. You know you're going to do poorly because you've been doing poorly on every test this semester. And so you decide that you're going to go out to happy hour Thursday night when your test is on Friday because you're not going to pass the test anyways. And there's really not a whole lot that you can do to study for it because you just don't get it. Well, in that case, the very next day when you failed the exam and then you got the test back the following week, you would probably turn to your neighbor and say, oh man, I partied so hard Thursday night, there was no way I was going to pass this test. And in that regard, you get to excuse your failure. Now most of us would say, well, wasn't that your choice? And your competence would be damaged because we would think, well, that's not very good thinking in terms of how you prepare for a test. If you don't get it, go to the teacher, study harder. You know all of the things that people tell you to do. But let's say, for example, instead of excusing your failure by setting up an ob obstacle that will make it impossible for you to succeed, let's say instead you studied really hard for that test and you put in four, five hours the night before reviewing, going over, asking a study partner, and you still fail that exam, my guess is you would come up with an excuse like this. That exam was not clear at all. I couldn't even make sense of the questions. Or it seemed like the teacher was trying to trick us. There was no possible way that all of the first 10 answers were A, and so I started choosing B because there can't be that many A's in a row. Or you may just say, you know what, this teacher is horrible. There's no possible way I'm going to pass this class. So your failure then is excused because it's out of your control, really. Those are the better ways to excuse failure, not put an obstacle in the way that will help you fail, but to make excuses instead of taking the full blame of your failure. Don't use them too often, obviously, but using them now and again is probably pretty commonplace, and I think we can all appreciate somebody who fails. I think it's more upsetting when somebody never fails. That person can get pretty irritating after a while because there's never any failure in their life. The fourth one, or the fourth goal, I should say, is to secure help. And the way that we do this is we really want somebody to come to our aid. And so what we do is we make statements that would secure the help without necessarily coming right out and asking them. And those are often achieved by self-deprecating strategies. And so I probably use this one again with my husband quite often. And I do it with our swimming pool because I'm in charge of maintaining the swimming pool. And so when I go back there and something is not going well, which it rarely does go well, and I'm back there and I can't get the vacuum cleaner in the pool to work. Normally what I will do is I will go in the house and I will say something like, I am not a pool man. I don't understand which way to put the button. It doesn't matter which way I put that button. It just doesn't make the vacuum cleaner go. I have no idea what I'm doing. Now, I haven't asked him for help. I guess the more effective manner would be, hey, I don't know what I'm doing. Could you come out and help me? Now, the problem is my husband doesn't have any idea either. Neither one of us do. But I'm going in making these complaints, and his answer or response to me is usually like, well, do you want me to come and look at it? And I've, in sense, secured help from him, and I've achieved my goal of securing help. Now, sometimes that's not my goal at all. Sometimes my goal is just to vent because I'm frustrated, and once I vent for a while, I feel better um, peace that I can go out and maybe try to figure it out because my frustration's kind of been shared or aired out. But other times, it may be a self-deprecating strategy that says, I'm totally incompetent, but I know that you can help me.